Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Okay, I'll try that again in my teacher voice. Good afternoon, everyone. We are elated that you have joined us for our keynote presentation of our Spring Diversity Forum. Uh, I am thankful for all of you and your attendance here today. We want to especially thank our chancellor and our provost for being with us on this afternoon. It gives me great joy and pleasure to present to you our keynote speaker. Um, many of you may have heard me share this, but I was able to witness his presentation in December at the Hate Bias Symposium that is uh, sponsored by UW La Crosse. And when I participated in his workshop, I immediately thought I have to get him to Whitewater, uh, not just because of the subject matter in which he is going to demonstrate on this afternoon, but just because he has a very interesting way of delivering some interesting subject matter and, and which can be hard for some people to swallow. And so I, I made a couple of calls, and he was so gracious to accept our invitation. And so it is without further ado, I would like to present to you Dr. Jorg Vianden. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. And thank you for having me at UW Whitewater today. It's my first time on campus. I said earlier, I've driven by several times, but I've not made the turn. I'm glad I made the turn. Love what the campus looks like. Reminds me of earlier campuses that I was on where not everything is red brick, but sometimes things are more like cream or limestone. So I sort of had an immediate sort of sense of home for me because Indiana University, one of my alma maters, looks very similar. Um, bigger institution, but looks similar. Thank you again to Dr. Yarbrough. Thank you to Brittany Dickerson. Thank you to the chancellor, the provost, everyone who's here and who has invited me. I always tell my students, keep your expectations low um, and hopefully you'll be surprised in the end or you might, might learn something. But my name is Jörg Vianden or the un-Americanized version Jörg Vianden, that's the German version. Uh, I've, I'm a dual German-American citizen, have been in this country for 25 years. Um, but I still very much connect, and you will hear this. You'll, uh, you'll also hear it in the accent, but you'll, you'll hear it throughout the talk. Um, I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm professor and still department chair of um, the Department of Student Affairs Administration at UW La Crosse. Uh, and I've been there for 10 years. Um, so been in Wisconsin now for a while. And today I'm going to talk to you about um, my book, and I'll, <laughs> I'll introduce that in a second. But uh, the title of this specific talk is God Solidarity, Strategies to Engage White College Men in Social Justice Advocacy. So this is a shameless plug, and throughout the entire um, presentation, it'll be a shameless plug. I think there have been three people, who, no, I'm just kidding. I don't know how many people have bought this book. They won't, they won't tell me until March. Um, but if you want to buy the book, then obviously you can. There, um, there, there were some folks um, that were in a previous workshop that I just did um, who, um, to whom this may seem familiar for the first sort of half or third of the presentation, um, but I am also sharing something that uh, I have not published and that is not part of, of this book, um, but I would be lying if I said that I didn't want you to buy it and didn't want you to read it. Books, books are labors of love, uh, right? I mean, as a, as a faculty member in our department, Nobody says, oh, great job on doing the book. Like, where's your peer-reviewed article, right? That's, that's what people want to see. Um, but I'm glad, I'm glad and I'm proud that, um, that I published it. So a few things here on the outline, a little bit more of an introduction of me and how I'm sort of positioned to do this work and to do this research. Um, some assumptions and problems, specifically thinking about how we engage um, straight white college men. That's what the acronym stands for. Uh, in this kind of work on diversity, um, and inclusion and equity. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the actual study that underlies this book. And then I'm going to try to do something that I have not done before, and that is to create a composite sketch of these almost 100 men that have participated across 10 different campuses. Um, and I'll, I'll show you why that's difficult to do. And then what's not in the book is this pedagogical model that I'm going to show you. And then we're going to end with some strategies. And it is not a super interactive talk, although there are points to ponder. And hopefully in the end, if there is time, we can pass the microphone around and, um, and go, with, go through some questions. All right, so the, <laughs> the first bullet. Um, 
this, this, this conference is about telling your stories, <coughs> right, or telling our stories. Um, and, and I don't fault anyone for thinking, why would we focus or center the stories of straight white college men in a, in a conference like this or at a, in a talk like this? Um, it is not so much that I want to center them, but that I want to unpack them, that I want to have us think about or have other straight white male educators specifically think about what those stories or what those comments mean to them, what might be implications for teaching and learning or for research or for advising or if you're in student affairs for administrative work or mentoring work with students. And so these stories, and I say this in a book, are about these men's upbringing in families and schools, how they sort of perceive issues concerning race, gender, and sexual orientation. Those are the three salient identities that I focused on in this book. Their angst or anxiety or trepidations around confronting others who display this kind of oppression or language or joking. Um, and maybe I'm trying to make a contribution to figure out or to, to lead to a new understanding of how white male disengagement may hinder um, social change progress in this society and to hopefully make a contribution to understanding contemporary masculinities um, because these are all male identified um, students. And I have done research specifically with men since my dissertation research um, 15 years ago. So I sort of continue this trend now um, with, with focusing specifically on white men. Um, so a little bit more of an introduction. I identify as white, straight, cis, able-bodied, um, upper middle class, although I wasn't born upper middle class, but by now probably consider myself as that. As I said, I'm a dual German and American citizen. And my race saliency as a white person allows me to focus on other identities than people of color or folks with other minoritized identities would. So I'm, I'm considering myself primarily a father, a partner, and a son. That is not what, what folks of color are able to do in this country or not what GLB folks are able to do or not what trans folk are able to do in this country um, because the society will sort of dictate their racial or their other minoritized identities as something that's more salient than student or than niece or than father. I'm also super privileged to be able to do this work as a teacher and a researcher. I teach, um, even though as a department chair, I get a course reassignment, but I love teaching. I work at a place like La Crosse, and I'm, I'm assuming that Whitewater is similar. Folks who are faculty here are primarily teachers. They're primarily um, viewing themselves as teachers. Research is important, but teaching and teaching excellence is key on a place, on a campus like, like this and like ours, and that's, that's what I'm most excited about. And in terms of uh, me and sort of my, the, the way I'm positioned to social justice or equity discussions, I always say that I'm a work in progress. I've not arrived or evolved to some sort of woke state where I never make any more mistakes, right? I'm, I get constantly called on by students, specifically students, um, by my faculty colleagues to sort of check the, the white maleness that, that, that I embody and that I uh, present. Uh, and, and I'm glad that I get checked on that because that, that, that will never stop and that needs to continue to happen. A little bit of a caveat before we start. So in this study uh, and in this book and in the research, gender is treated in the binary. So we have men as participants or folks that identified as men. Um, we have research that, that uh, discusses the gender differences between men and women. But when I say mas masculinities and when we talk about masculinities in the book, then that means that we include all men, all that are male identified. Um, no matter how um, they are born or no matter how they identify otherwise, if they identify as men, then they are included in the term masculinities. And that is clearly also evolving, right? There are um, many more and much more research out lately on trans masculinities or on femme masculinities that, that are really important as, as a contribution to masculinities studies in general in this study um, th that is unfortunately not part of it, but there are some thoughts about sort of moving that in a different direction. I'm making four assumptions 
uh, in this book and also in this study. The first is that oppression in this country and in other countries was created by folks who look and identify like privileged social groups and we have the responsibility to help end uh, or disrupt um, that. Um, my primary audience in this, um, that doesn't mean that folks of color, uh, women, folks with different or diverse genders or sexual orientations aren't included or shouldn't be included, but my primary audience are other straight white male educators um, to whom I can say you ought to do this work. I would not be able to say that and I wouldn't say that to folks who are minoritized by people like me. So if you're triggered by straight white men in your classrooms or in your advising office or in your practice, I won't say to you, you need to educate them. I would, I would love for you to tell me and your other straight white male colleagues that they should educate them. Okay, so my main audience in this are other straight white uh, male educators. Um, we also assume that privileged folks or folks with primarily privileged identities ought to do some self work. They ought to develop empathy, build solidarity, part of the title of the, of the book and of the study and become accomplices to minoritized folks in this fight for equity and social justice, which they have been involved in since the day that they were born um, and continue to be. And for us, it's not the case that we need to take this fight over sort of this white savior mentality, but to be accomplices in that work, to support that work where we can, to work with other white folks who may not understand it at some level yet. Um, but, but to be accomplices. And the last one might be a little bit surprising, but that straight white men have the capacity for pro-social behaviors, for empathy, for, soli for solidarity, and for advocacy for social change. If you think about the problem, either as a research problem or a problem in practice, we think about sort of four different ones. First, systemic oppression um, that is widespread um, in a state like this, in a country like this, on a campus like this, or mine at UW La Crosse. Um, a big issue is the invisibility of whiteness, the fact that I can say stuff like I'm a father, a partner, and son, um, and that I don't have to highlight my race. That is not what other folks uh, get, to, get to be able to do in, in this society. And then we have to think about sort of how white men behave in settings such as these or in their communities and how their engagement or their critique or their resistance to these kinds of effort um, sometimes thwarts those efforts or uh, puts a stop to them. And this, this disengagement, resistance, and critique is strong. It's not only strong in politics. Uh, if you open any media, virtual or social or print, or turn on the TV, you see this kind of white male disengagement, criticism, and resistance on a daily basis. And that is a major problem that we need to figure out what to do about. Um, Michael Kimmel, a, a very famous or well-known sociologist at um, uh, uh, um, um, SUNY Stony Brook in, in, on Long Island in New York, uh, has, has written now two editions of this book uh, called Angry White Men, American Masculinity at the End of an Era where he's describing, these are, these are not college students that he's talking about, but where he's describing white men who have become so angry about who they are and about where they live and about their society that they have been raised to believe that this is their country that they need to take away from others, um, that they are entitled to a job that will support their family as the sole breadwinner, that they will receive deference from an adoring partner and obedient children, that they reclaim what they feel entitled to economically or socially based on where they were, what family they were born into, who their parents were, hard work, um, this sort of sense of meritocracy that hard work will, will get you anywhere. Um, that's not the case for all social groups, obviously, in, in this uh, society and country, and that this of aggrieved entitlement that sort of restores the sense of manhood, dominance, and power. Um, I'm going to show you a slide, and I want to give you a warning that um, it's, it's, it's a sort of an in-your-face image, um, and you, you may not 
um, be okay with that, but I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to, to move forward. Um, so if you think about Donald Trump, he may be actually the epitome of the aggrieved, entitled, toxically masculine, um, heterosexual white male with a variety of problems and issues that he seemingly constantly talks about on the left. And if you're looking at sort of the resting this away from others, taking it away from others, then these sort of statements or mantras that, th that this platform has been using now for over four years of making America great again or go back to your country in the sense of othering other individuals make perfect sense, right? It's like, I want to rest away this country from who has made it bad for hundreds of years and I'm taking it away. Or I'm telling you that if you're criticizing me, I'm telling you to go back to where you came from, even those folks are also um, uh, American born and American citizens. Um, it's, this, it's this sense of othering folks of this platform that, that has worked in this country, unfortunately, for 400 years, and that continues to work um, uh, by, uh, by, the, by the actions and the words uh, of, of folks that are in the highest positions uh, in this country. And to not make this super political, I also have a Hillary Clinton photo later on, so that you just, just to make sure that we're as even as we can be, and I'm also gonna be critical of that. So. Problems on campus, this is what I mentioned earlier. This is a photo of um, Indiana University, the sample gates, uh, same sort of limestone, uh, sort of cream colored accents that really reminded me today of that. So we have to talk about problems on campus as well. So we know that from a vast amount of literature, Linda Sachs in a, in a very famous book uh, more than 10 years ago now, but continuous research out there on this, that white men do in fact actually learn from these kinds of conversations from these conferences, from a course on diversity and social justice. It's just that um, it's been difficult for them to sort of find access into that. If you look at Nessie data over the last 15 years at least, we know that um, white seniors, this is not white men, this is all students, white seniors interact 10% less frequently across difference than all other social groups, and white men always uh, interact less than white women uh, in this sort of sense. And um, Nessie is sort of administered in the first year and in the senior year. The, when you look at the data o over the long term, then interactions actually stagnate between the first year and the fourth year. And there is a variety of thoughts that we might have about why that happens, but you might see it also on a, on a campus uh, such as UW-Widewater. What we said earlier, this disengagement some, might, some white men may also ardently resist, and there's examples in the book, uh, of a classroom, of a conversation, of an effort or of an initiative, of a conference such as this. And then so that leaves us with this major dilemma that I'm calling that if, if we have white men who come into college with these skills or, or these um, qualifications to sort of do this work, and they don't have any touch points from us, and they leave or they don't participate or they exit, then they may actually leave college not any more adept at handling or working through these issues as when they came in. And, and at that point, I would say that a person like me as a straight white male educator ha has sort of failed in a way, right? Um, we have already pawned this work off for too long, and, and now we're getting folks in and out of college without them having any additional skill, that might be an issue of failure on, on the part of, a, of an educator like me. We're also calling, or I'm also calling um, white men uh, climate creators on a, on a pre predominantly white institution such as this. And they don't do this just by um, welcoming or pro-social actions, they may also do it by inactions or by condoning, condoning oppression that they, that they notice in their environment or that they notice from their friends. And this is, by the way, not exclusive to straight white male college students. This, is also, uh, this, uh, this also pertains to white male administrators, white male faculty, white male students of, student affairs professionals. Um, it, it, it affects everyone. 
on a college campus is it not just an issue that um, we worry about students getting involved in. This last bullet is really important. Um, lots of research over the years that talks about this vast overestimation of the campus climate by white students, um, faculty, and staff. So this idea of does racism exist on your campus? I'm not sure. I don't see it. I don't think so. How does everyone feel on campus? It's a pretty welcoming place. I think everyone feels fine. White students, white faculty, white staff say that all the time, not just at a place like this or lacrosse, but it's all over the literature. Um, and, it, it, and it is part of this understanding of what do I do to a, a campus climate and how can I affect that, that climate in a way. This is specifically about uh, white faculty. So um, this is also well documented in the literature that, that white faculty and specifically white male faculty have been engaged in a process that Schuth's and colleagues call ducking diversity. So it's the sense that I know that I ought to be teaching diversity as content, but I'm staying away from it um, because I'm saying it's not my expertise. Um, it's not, my, it's not where I'm trained. Faculty say that all the time. It, it's not my expertise. I, 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 do, I do this. I don't do that. Right? Um, and this, this issue then is that white faculty are actually not evaluated poorly based on not teaching this content. Faculty of color are always, most always, evaluated more poorly than white faculty um, by white students for working on this content on, and for delivering this content. So there's this major disconnect. Um, if you think about SEIs, student evaluations of instruction, right? Faculty of color in my own department by our own students get downgraded based on teaching diversity content. Me does not get downgraded for not teaching diversity content, right? So this, this is something that exists uh, on a college campus. And and it contributes to the problem of climate and, and what we do about it. Okay, so a point for you to ponder and for me to take a drink, but um, what attitudes and behaviors by white students, staff, faculty, and administrators are common at UW-Whitewater in the context of diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice? And if I had planned this better, we would do this in a sort of call and response, but just for yourself, just sort of reflect on this question and think about your answers. And I'll keep going in a second. A conference such as this or a week such as this at UW-Whitewater or what, what we do every semester or every year at UWL and what, what countless institutions do throughout the country in terms of diversity conferences or equity-based or social justice-based conferences means to me that this work is happening, right? So we're doing this work here. We're doing it on other campuses. We're thinking about perhaps what the answer to this implies for college teaching, for research, for mentoring, for advising students, for working with them, for mentoring students. But this room isn't full, right? I know it's also a Thursday. There's classes going on, a faculty are teaching, right? Are there other folks on campus that are having these conversations? Um, are, are, there, are there discussions happening such as this um, that are going on on a, on a near daily basis? Or is this something that at a predominantly white institution we do all the time and say, that's the work of multicultural student support. That's the work of the Pride Center. That's the work of a diversity-focused office. I'm not a diversity-focused office in residence life where I spent 11 great years as a professional. Other people do that. I don't do that, right? So how, what, is, what does that imply for the work that we need to be doing? So the next few slides are just to sort of snapshot the, this, this research study a little bit more. We call it the Straight White College Men Project. 
The data collection took place between 2013 and 2016. And then it took three years to write the book. And the first time that the, the box came home um, and I opened it and I was so proud and my oldest daughter Greta came home from school and I said, close your eyes and open your hands. And she's like, oh, Papa, whatever. And so I'm, I, she's holding out her hands. I put the book in. She looks at it. She goes, no lie. That took you way too long to finish. <laughs> um, and I said, and I said, I love you too. Um, and uh, so yes, books are a labor of love. And it took a while, but anyway, uh, I, th I think Greta now appreciates it. But in that moment, typical teenager, like, whatever, Dad. It's like, it's not important. Okay, um, we started with the question of that that you might ask yourself on a campus like this: Where are all the white men when we talk about these kinds of conversations or, or topics of diversity, social justice, equity, inclusion? We started with a sample of 92 straight white college men at 10 different institutions. And then we added later 80, 88 participants who had at least one minoritized identity. Um, so it became 13 four-year institutions in the end. The book is based on the sample of 92 straight white men. We uh, had 35 identity caucus focus groups, and that meant that the white male students were never in the same focus group of a person with at least one minoritized identity. So we caucus those groups um, deliberately. We used phenomenology as a, a, a qualitative methodology, and we used the phenomenon of sort of diversity on campus, or the interaction with diversity on campus, or the potential engagement in, diver in diversity in, on campus. There are more than 2,000 quotes. The book is full of them, but there is obviously a whole data set left of the 88 participants that I have not done something yet with, and I'm hoping that this summer um, I can start on that. And whether it's a book or not, we'll see, but that, that data is just as important, or even, perhaps even more important than the first set. You, you see here my, <laughs> my um, cell phone picture of the actual table of the, the institutions in the book. So these are all pseudonyms. To, to maintain confidentiality of the students. The institutions are mostly in the Midwest, but um, a few sprinkled here and there on the, in the South and in the West. Um, private and public were sort of um, uh, equal. Uh, small liberal arts, college, liberal arts college to large research institutions and everything in between. Percent of white undergrads, St. Margaret University has the lowest percentage of white undergrads at 50%. Um, Riverside State has the highest at 89, and then the percent of male undergrads um, on the right. Um, just, just showing you these to s sort of see where, where we were and where we, did, where we did the research. The research team consisted of three faculty and a graduate student. Um, the sole author in the end of the book was me, but I'm, I'm clearly mentioning them that without them, this would not have happened. These are some of the focus group questions that we ask students. And as you, I'm not going to read them, but as you read them or as you look at them, think about how students on this campus might answer uh, some of these questions if they were in um, a focus group. In the middle, the, the one that is the identity based question is extremely important. The what is it like to be, and then fill in the blank in terms of your identity on this campus. Uh, that, that's a um, critical question to this entire project, um, not only based on identity, but based on salient identity. How does this campus view me as um, a, a person of color or a, a, a trans person or a straight white male student? Another point to ponder, how would students answer the questions of what's it like? I think I just said that, but what's it like to be a student on this campus? Um, and how they have confronted oppression on campus or in the community. And you can sort of, in your own mind, think about how students, maybe even how you would answer this, these questions and, and what sort of that implies for how folks work with one another, interact with one another, study with one another, learn on this campus. So on the next few slides, I will show you findings, and I will read some of them. 
these, these are the verbatim quotes or comments or statements made by some of the uh, 92 participants, and I tried to sort of vary them to make sure that we had most institutions represented in this, in this sample. Think about the fact that this is a qualitative study. This, this study is not meant to generalize to a larger population. These are 92 students at 10 different institutions throughout the country. That does not mean that each other straight white male student on their campus feels exactly the same or even close. We're not making any generalizations uh, in this study, so I think it's important to mention that. So this composite sketch that I'm trying to create um, is sort of the average response, which is really difficult to do, of these 92 participants. So they're talking about growing up white and growing up isolated, even in metropolitan communities. And we talked about this earlier with uh, Chancellor Watson in, in, in the previous um, workshop, this, this sense of affinity of white people to continue to want to be uh, affiliated with other white people it has been documented in the literature for 30 years. Um, it, this, this is one of the reasons why Nessie shows this stagnation between year one and year four, because as we are first year students coming to campus, we might be open to racial difference or to interacting, but then as we sort of move into the circles of who, who we're most like, then we move off campus with them, then we have jobs with them, and then we're not interacting with the other folks anymore who lived across from us in the residence hall the, in the first semester, right? And this sort of affinity continues throughout life, and it starts early in life, uh, and, and our research showed that as well. Diversity is not about us. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm making this painstakingly obvious, and it's sad to say, but diversity, social justice, equity, um, and inclusion conversations may, may be entirely irrelevant to many straight white male college students. And it's really stark to sort of say it like that. Um, but, but unfortunately in our study, that, that's what came out. I'm not here for this. We are the victims of affirmative action or reverse affirmative action. We are the victims of uh, ubiquitous race-based scholarships. There were only five focus groups that talked about that, but it's, that's a quarter of them all, but it's important to mention that here. Why does norm, or I get a lot of comfort from, from being on campus where everybody looks like me. It's hard to speak up, a whole chapter dedicated to this single quote, this idea of not wanting to confront, not wanting to do anything about oppression in, in my environment because I'm afraid of wanting to be that guy that gets ousted from the friend group. And in masculinities research, that has also been documented for a long number of time. <laughs> a long number of time. The, the German is uh, struggling, yes, for a, for a long number of years. And then sort of the average, and I mentioned this in the previous workshop, the average of these 92, there probably is a sense that they have some responsibility to engage in this and to do something about it. Uh, but there were also folks that said, I'm not responsible at all. And there were also folks that said, I'm clearly responsible. Give me more. I need to learn. Okay, so Tyler, I didn't see many African Americans in my town, but now, on my, but now on my floor in the dorms, you're hesitant to approach them and make friends because you don't know how to act, you know, you feel kind of awkward. So the sense of white isolation, uh, is specifically in Midwestern towns, but also uh, in larger metropolitan areas, uh, was a theme that carried throughout some of these early conversations. In Catholic school, we had black kids, we had kids of other races, but I never hung out with them, never tried to befriend them. I think part of that is me. I grew up in a very conservative ma white male dominant environment, like I grew up fishing and hunt, uh, grew up hunting and fishing. I would say that even in, into college now, I've made little effort to befriend anyone that I find super diverse from me. I always look for someone who's very similar to me in many aspects. This, this fits the, the research findings of previous re research to a T. It's the sense of, I'm comfortable with who I am and I'm comfortable with the folks that look like me and those that don't, I'm not necessarily reaching out to or connecting with. And so you ask yourself as a college educator, as a student, do we have a responsibility to create that in a different way on a college campus? Can we or can we not? Diversity is not about us. 
it's all about other diversity besides the white male. My knee-jerk reaction when I hear diversity is just instantly anything non-white because that's how it's driven home, especially on this campus. This is the West Coast, one of the West Coast campuses, uh, extremely uh, West Coast, um, where 50% of the students are students of color. It feels like I don't add anything to, I don't add to diversity, whereas someone who is a minority can feel like they add to diversity. This was a, a, an institution in the inner mountain region of the United States. I'm not here for this. The racial course or whatever doesn't really interest me. I know that there's diverse or different people, different cultures, things like that, but I'm here to get my pilot's license. The sense of irrelevancy, right, that I, I'm here, I'm not here for this, I'm here for what I want to do, and that is to get a degree, and those are all totally valid reasons. I mean, college students are in college to get a degree, to get a job, right? How much of that ought to be sort of interlaced with connecting with others while still getting a pilot's license, right? I don't fault, I don't fault Gabriel, these are all pseudonyms, I don't fault him for saying that, but, but this is what might be happening. Um, here's an old reference, you can see how old this research is. I'm not sure that anybody still watches Duck Dynasty or where you can even find it, I'm sure it's on YouTube, but it just doesn't seem enjoyable to me, like I'd rather sit at home and watch Duck Dynasty. It's not that I don't care, it's just that I'm not necessarily interested we're we were talking about how to engage straight white men into diversity programs or co-curricular events. We're the victims. Again, small group of students talking about this, but important enough to mention it. On the first day, the professor pointed out how if you're white, male, and middle class, you're a horrible person. I felt kneecapped from the beginning. I call this white male bashing or perceived white male bashing that students talked about professors doing uh, in, their, in their college classrooms, and most of these professors were, were people of color and women, right? So you sort of see the trend of who, who they're sort of listening to. I applied to the engineering school for our state and didn't get in. It's interesting how I'm just another white guy, and then there's this Iranian guy, because he's more ethnic, they needed to have a certain diversity quota. Students don't know what an institution puts into the requirements for admissions, let alone they know what goes into the admissions process and how someone is admitted over someone else. But to them, this, this perception is reality, right? That if, the, if they see a person of color or a person from uh, an ethnically minoritized uh, culture or ethnicity uh, gets in and I don't, then that, mean, that must mean that that institution has quotas, ethnicity-based quotas or race-based quotas. Whether that's actually the case is beside the point. To them, this is reality, right? More scholarships are available to minorities. I got a black friend who had a certain GPA and he got a laptop. They don't have that for white men. Well, on that campus, it's very likely that they also have it for white men, but in this case, our students sort of didn't know what all went into who got what uh, on a college campus. Um, again, the perception that other people get something and I don't is their reality. Whether it is the actual reality, we don't know. But to them, this exists as what we called, a, what we asked about, a drawback of being straight white male on this campus. This, this whole aspect of white is norm and white is sort of comfortable. We don't have to think about our identities in every situation. There's so many people who look like us and our way of being is sort of a cultural norm. We just don't have to be thinking about it and interrogating how our identity is affecting the way we're moving through social spaces. It's a um, fairly elaborate or important uh, a quote of this entire book because there are folks who are beginning to understand that this experience of being a college student looks very differently for others depending on, depending on um, ethnic or racial or uh, gender or sexual orientation background. Um, but it is not the majority of folks who began to realize that or who talked about it. What I said earlier already, this idea of it's hard to speak up. It, it's hard to speak up to family, specifically family, family, friends, and strangers. We asked all those three parts. I don't think I would confront. I just feel like, say, if I would say something, my family would just immediately judge me. Like, you know, he goes to college, and does he feel smarter than the rest of us? If you're a rural student, 
um, and uh, or if you come from a rural background, this is something that you may have that you may have uh, experienced before. This is also well documented in the literature. This idea of the college kid coming home and thinking they're better, right? There, there is a vast culture of anti-intellectualism still in this country, um, and this is part of that, right? It's the sense of these kids go to college and they want to be, they think they're better, right? And so they're educating me, but I don't want them to educate them, so I'm going to put them back in their place. One of the reasons why they don't want to confront, especially not family. I won't read the last word of this, but going back home, it's different because you watch what you say out here on campus. Back home, I test my brothers to not say words like, I'm like, ouch, dude, that really hurts people. And they're just like, oh, shut up, you. Right? This, this kind of sense that these, these students are going home, they're connecting with their, 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 their loved ones and their siblings, and they're trying to sort of figure out how they move about these different spaces of family and campus, and they get sort of smacked in the face. Um, that, that came up over and over again. One of the reasons why they don't confront is because of what I said earlier, they don't want to be fired from their friend group. As men, we, uh, even though we're not socialized that way, we continue to want to belong to something, to someone else, uh, to a friend group, to people that make us feel good. Um, and that, that is an emotional connection. Uh, and if we have the sense that if I say something uh, to a joke or to a racist comment, I'm going to be ousted from that group or I'm going to be fired, as Michael Kimmel says, from that friend group, then I'm not going to do that because I'm weighing the cost and the benefit of, uh, of being let go by my friends. And I don't, I don't want that. Uh, and so um, if you're in your friend group and you're the only guy who throws the first wet blanket on the joke, I've never actually heard that, but I, I, I like it. Uh, on the joke everyone else gets, there could be serious repercussions. If you're the guy who ruins uh, jokes every time, you don't want to be that guy. Uh, lots of research on this in the literature uh, that is confirmed by the research that we conducted. The sense of the norm group is so strong that I will not do anything to stick out um, and if I want to stick out, then I'm going to find someone else to connect with first, and then together we stick out against the larger group. But it's this idea that the confronter of the joke has to think about having the violence of the comment or the joke turned on them, kind of like um, what, what Derek's brothers did to him, right? It's the sense of I'm trying to, I'm trying to sort of be cool with you about this, what you're saying hurts people, and they react this way. They're turning the violence around, right? And I have to justify myself as the center or as the confronter more than the person who's telling the joke or who's making the comment who widely goes unchecked, right? That sort of is very male normative behavior in a, in a male friend group. All right. Um, th this is part that is not in the book and I'm going to ask for your uh, creative suggestions here in a, fr in a, in a second. Um, but I'm trying to create, even though it's difficult and we don't really do that in qualitative research, I'm trying to create some sort of model that would explain or inform or not predict because it's qualitative, but inform what is happening with, uh, with these students. Um, and we sort of came up with this idea of uh, the four planes of solidarity building of straight white college men. Uh, and so some of you may be in student affairs and some of you um, may be faculty. So you've, you've all heard of sort of human development theories, stages of human development, circles of human development, arrows of human development. How, how do we sort of progress through the stages of life or through, through learning? And so it's really hard to, to sort of put that um, for sure in a two-dimensional sort of setting. But we're thinking of there's this there's this personal sphere that exists uh, that includes these four planes. And you'll, show the, you'll see the larger model in a second. Um, but we start on the left with ideas of we're victims, uh, we need to resist this, we're passive. Uh, we're moving into this idea of identities, consciousness, thinking about privilege and oppression. Not only ours, but, but everyone else's. And then we slowly move into this area of 
um, responsibility, engagement, advocacy, and hopefully, um, maybe as an educator I can say hopefully, because at the end we have empathy, solidarity, and to being an accomplice and to being in and living in solidarity with others. All of these involve thinking and action. On, on the left-hand side, uh, it's, it's mostly thinking, uh, and the action uh, is not yet, um, well, on the, <laughs> on the left side, there is very little thinking about others, and there's very little action directed towards others. As we get into the green, the, the action and the thinking get to be sort of thinking about others a little bit more towards the right and on the far right, we're, we're seeing now um, advocacy that is not just in research, not just in writing, not just in talking to others, but to actually being physically engaged, um, going along with folks, participating in events, calling politicians to, to sort of be more action oriented. Uh, and so the pedagogical model that that I want to show you um, looks like this, and um, Dr. Yarbrough has seen this, and I'm indebted to my two colleagues, one from Kansas and one from Oklahoma, to come up with a model that looks like a tornado uh, over the plains with bad weather, right? So um, it, it, it was uh, readily apparent to them that that's what it needed to be. I'm like, yeah, because you're from there and you see this stuff all the time. Um, so we have this structural or systemic fear, sort of the clouds in this, and this is sort of whimsical, I get that, but I, but, I think it, but I think that it sort of represents what I think we ought to be doing as educators, um, and that is to look at the structural or systemic fear that exists with socialization of students before college and in college, and we're part of that even before college, but we're definitely part of it now, and oppression and privilege in a variety of ways, and the individual or personal sphere that I just showed you, the planes of solidarity building, and where we come in as educators, sort of as a, as a I can't say that in English, centrifugal force, right? You know what I mean? Centrifugish, yeah, if, there, there you go. Um, sort of move across the rain and the planes that are going this way. So if we're moving across, and Chancellor Watson talked about this earlier, what we want to create in college classrooms or spaces like these or in the co-curriculum are disorienting dilemma, intellectual vertigo, some people call it ontological dizziness, um, dissonance and challenge. Right? We talked about dissonance about an hour ago. Um, it's not just the educators that have to do that. It's also the, the people themselves, right? The self also has to do that and their peers also have to do that. So if, if we all sort of do that together, um, then hopefully we're creating a student who is more aware, more critically conscious, more active, feels more responsible, builds solidarity, connects with others, doesn't isolate from others, uh, and, and sort of continues to move through college and hopefully life after when, by the way, all these men will likely be in positions of power, uh, influence, um, in the economy, in industry, where they can actually make that kind of change. Um, and, and we sort of need to help get them there. So, um, so it, it, talk to me afterwards, but the windy model, the vertigo model, the thunder model, I have no idea what, what to call this, but but, but, but the main thing is that we provide this, this, this force as educators that, that moves against this, um, this, this strain and this movement um, that straight white men um, may be sort of on a path of least resistance, right, in, in terms of um, diversity and, and, and social justice. And we need to provide that resistance uh, and um, yeah, I'll stop there. Okay, we started at uh, one and we have till 2.15, Dr. Arbor. We might have time for question and answer. All right, 
Famous last words. If, if I say to students, we're ending at 12 and they're still there at 12.15, that's a problem. So yes, uh, I, 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 I promise to be um, quick. Um, there are nine strategies that I use in the book and I wanna mention uh, four here specifically. And now I have to go to the book and actually read. Um, and here is the much awaited um, Senator Clinton uh, photo. Um, what I'm calling for specifically white male educators to do is to join, not disassociate. Um, and I don't know if you remember this comment, but I'll let you read it for a second. Senator Clinton said this during a campaign rally, I think in the upstate New York, about the people for whom she would have also been the president, right? So this sense of disassociating from those who may not be as evolved, who may not be as smart, who may vote for the other side, uh, who, um, who, who, who are just to be criticized based on who they are, or what they believe, um, is this sort of sense of distancing or disassociation. We see this all the time continues, continuously in politics. This is one of the reasons why populist politicians had the chance to be elected. Um, this is why, one of the reasons why Brexit happened, right? Because we're distancing ourselves from the immigrants and we're distancing ourselves from the people that wanna be here. Um, and it, 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 by the way, is also the, the, I was mentioning this earlier, why we now have more than 100 um, parliamentarians from the right-wing extremist group in Germany sitting in the German parliament since 1933, the first time that we have that many sitting there. No one wants to talk to them, I get that. No one wants to engage with them, no one wants to make policy with them. But the reason that they're there is because we have pushed that side away for a very long time. And in, in my estimation, whether we push right-wing extremists away, yes, I get that. But white male students who are sort of at a different level, at least as a white male educator, I'm, 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 I'm struggling not to do and I'm, I'm trying to be not willing um, to do. But I don't wanna just um, criticize Senator Clinton. I also um, want to read from my personal experience. The year was 1994. This is the part where we do sort of a public reading uh, from the book. Um, I've never actually done this. The, the year was 1994. I was 22 in my first I was 22 and in my first semester at my undergraduate alma mater in Iowa, having transferred from the university in my hometown in Germany. I remember hanging out in one night in my friend Andrea's room. Andrea is a pseudonym. Several of her friends were also present. Andrea was from the Midwest, white, and I assumed she was straight. We were friends and I enjoyed her company because of her jovial nature. She and the friends in the room were members of some of the choirs for which our college was well known, is well known. When Andrea asked me whether I liked, I liked to sing, I responded, not really, because I sing so high that it makes me sound gay. That was not the first time I had ever ridiculed members of different sexual orientations but it was the first time my joking garnered the kind of response Andrea provided. Her face grew visibly upset and she yelled, don't ever say something like that again. At this point, we were standing just a few feet apart. And even though Andrea was more than a foot shorter than me, she was a force to be reckoned with. Oh yeah, I said jokingly, what are you gonna do about it? I know how this sounds and I'm sure Andrea received it similar, similarly like uttered by a complete jerk. I'm going to punch you in the face, she snarled back. At this point, I didn't know whether she was serious or joking, but I decided she could only mean the latter because we had so often laughed and had fun together. Okay, I said, hit me right here. And this is exactly how I did it. I sort of bent, bent down, pointing at my right cheek and bending forward a little. Before I could react or avoid Andrea's fist hitting my jaw, I felt my head snap back from her left hook. It clearly wasn't a friendly tap, but an enraged blow that made my ears ring. Silence fell over the room and 
Andrea and the rest of the people in the room looked at me worriedly, wondering what I would do next. Smiling nervously, I stammered, uh, I better go now, turned around and left the room. That was the last time I spoke to Andrea until we found each other on Facebook nearly 10 years later and then had a conversation about this incident. After she punched me, I couldn't figure out why it hurt her so much that I made a joke about someone sounding gay when they sing. Did she identify as a lesbian? Did some of her friends or family? Or did she simply not want me to tell offensive jokes in her presence? And so what, what Andrea's fist to my face was, although most educators probably are more interested in less violent disorienting dilemmas, was a disorienting dilemma, right? It was for the first time that I thought, why did that comment hurt? It, it was an asshole comment to make, I know that, right? I know that now, but I didn't know it then. Um, why, did it, why did it create this, this sort of reaction? But from that moment, I, I, I thought, and I did, I said, okay, I'm, if it hurt her, it must hurt tons of others. What else am I saying that hurts other people when they're not standing up to me? I better think about that. I better not. I better not. I better not. And so it's this, it's this moment that started this sense of um, disorienting dilemma that, that I learned something from her fist to my face. And when we talked about it, I said, you know, you, would, you, you might not remember that. And she's like, oh, yeah, I remember that very well. Um, I said, you know, I'm involved in all kinds of diversity stuff on my campus and I'm teaching this kind of stuff. And she's like, well, good for you. <laughs> and we start, it was a Facebook conversation. We s just sort of left it at that. And I, I'm not sure whether she thought that I had really sort of moved on from this. Remember, I said work in progress all the time. Um, but that is, you know, 25 years ago. Uh, and, and I have tried very hard and hopefully never have made a similar comment since. But I did make comments like that up, uh, up until that point. So my point with this whole thing is, if, if we as white male educators think that the white men that we're dealing with are not evolved enough, are not smart enough, are not cool enough to talk to, when we may, when we may have similar sort of things in our closet, we can't do that, right? I'm not asking folks of color not to be triggered by white men or folks with different sexual orientations not be triggered by straight men, but I'm asking white men to not be triggered by white men because we may have a history of saying similar things, right? And you see this all the time, this sort of madvocacy that happens, like, no, I've completely moved on. I don't even remember that part of myself. Uh, I would never say that again. Well, yeah, I don't say it again now either, but that doesn't make me forget that I have said it before and need to continue to think about what that does to people and how I present. If we, if we, if we continue the disassociation, what we, what we in fact do is what I call in the book and other places, the ability to let straight white men hide in the corner with a blanket over their head. It's almost like a security blanket, right? It's the sense that their identities allow them to disengage from these kinds of conversations in classrooms, in programs, in co-curricular settings. And if we disassociate and if we don't pull them back out from under that blanket, we have missed the chance to engaging them, especially as a white male educator. If we leave them under the blanket, it might happen that we lose them forever because one comment, like as the kneecapping comment earlier by the student who said, they were bashing me as a white male, that student likely never participated in that class again and likely as a result learned very little from that class even though he could have learned something, right? So this is something to think about is how much are we allowing them to retreat into a corner, being in a class not saying anything for the rest of the semester or how much do we actually sort of pull them out from under that? We just talked about um, disorienting dilemmas, um, obviously, but um, something that's important is the, last, is the last bullet, and that is it's completely negotiable for students to engage in this work. 
I know that we're not going to get all students engaged in this, and that might be fine. It is not negotiable for educators not to create this kind of setting where students might have the ability to learn. And I don't think that, I don't think that faculty or, or student affairs professionals do this on purpose of not sort of trying to engage men in this, but it is, it is critically important that we be this force that pushes against the systemic oppression and the socialization that, that they have been, that they have been participating in for 18 years. We have them for four to six. I don't know what your six year graduation rates are, but we have them for four to six, right? That, that is a lot of stuff to unlearn in four to six years, especially if they don't participate. Um, I don't know what your diversity requirements are on this campus, but I'm calling for in the book to require diversity in all majors, regardless of whether it's in the social sciences, in the natural sciences, in business, um, in engineering, anywhere. Anywhere where we're dealing with humans, we have the ability to talk about diversity, right? Even in accounting, even in management, uh, ev even in computer science where we think, what does this have to do with diversity? Well, it has something to do with diversity because the folks that are sitting in front of you or that are in front of you in, the, in these chairs um, live and they have something to do with this. So if you think about sort of a buffet, um, I liken this, this, this requiring diversity in the major uh, to, to this sort of sense of buffet. So you're, you're moving along the buffet, you're taking something that you want to eat. I mean, you're there, right? You're hungry. Uh, there's something that you ought to eat, fruits and vegetables, um, other stuff that you ought to eat, and there's some stuff that we don't want because I don't eat herring and I won't touch it, right, even though it might be good for me. Um, straight white college men don't choose enough of the stuff that would be good for them, and there's nobody standing behind the counter that says on the house or from the kitchen, right? So they're walking through this process uh, by themselves, um, or they're moving through this process by themselves without having someone else say, what about this, what about that? There are 92 men in this study. The average overall number of going beyond a diversity elective for all of them was 0.6. That means in roughly 550 semesters that these students were at their alma mater, they together took 55 diversity electives. 550 semesters, 55 diversity electives the institution didn't require them to take. The, the, the folks with minoritized identities in the sample were almost three times that high, right? So white men are not taking these courses unless they're required to do so. And sometimes when they're required to do so, the institution chooses courses that have nothing to do with sort of American senses of um, oppression, power, and privilege. They might be, as one student said, a Russian language course that stood in for a diversity course or a German language course. We, we can't afford to have students move through this um, by taking courses that are globally focused and we call it a diversity requirement. These students move through, they have no sense of American diversity in the sense that, that, that we've been talking about for 400 years and it's been going on. Th this is a major issue. I know we have faculty in the room. I know we have um, senior academic officer in, in the room. Th these, these are issues that um, are important to think about. And lots of faculty say, let the social sciences deal with that. Let the humanities deal with that. Sociology is a great major on this campus. Lots of courses on diversity there, right? But not everybody is going to be a sociology major. And folks still need this kind of work. So that's, that's something to think about, and that's something that's important. Listen and follow. I, I don't know if you remember last fall this very famous now um, article in the Dickinson College student newspaper by a, a woman by the name of Lita Fisher who said, I cannot describe to you how frustrating it is to be forced to listen to a white boy explain his take on the black experience in the Obama area. Hey, Brian. I'm an actual black woman alive right now with a brain. In what world would your understanding of my life carry more weight than my understanding? Right? So this article, should white people still be allowed to talk, it was like a brush fire in, in social media, right? That this, that this woman, this biracial woman, was 
allowed to say these kinds of mean things about the white students that are, that are among her in her classes, uh, when she has a perfectly great point, right? To, f to, to, to have white male students listen to and follow the experiences of others because the experiences of others are just as valuable, perhaps more valuable in a specific context than their own. But white men get so much airtime, are so confident, uh, are so vo vociferous, always talking, always deciding, always leading. Think about that if you're teaching or if you're a student, who first talks in some of your classrooms, who first talks in some of your faculty meetings, who first decides, right? Who is most confident? The research will, <laughs> I just asked you and you're sort of talking to one another. Maybe this isn't true at Whitewater, which would be great. The research has said for years, men do that more. Men are more confident, even though they might have no reason to be. Men decide, right? This is not just exclusive to students, by the way, as the, as the fourth bullet says. Don't expect minoritized people to teach you. People with minoritized identities do self-work. That's part of the following, right? Others' experiences and realities may count more than yours, especially in this kind of context. So for Brian in that classroom, when there, when there are folks of color around and you're talking about an African-American experience in some political time, maybe this is not the time for the white guy to start talking. Maybe this is to, to sort of listen and follow. That's, that's all she said in that article and that's all she wanted to say and it blew up. So something to think about on this campus as well. Okay, leave you with this. White college men must begin to critically problematize the insidious racist, sexist, and homophobic framing elite white men have used so successfully to establish systems of oppression. We should no longer passively witness these human atrocities as they ravage our country and our humanity. I hope you will heed this call, or this is an addition, or engage your students in this work. It will be worth it, I guarantee it, for yourself, your loved ones, colleagues, friends, and future generations of you. Better yet, your engagement will lend a hand to individuals from minoritized backgrounds who have been oppressed for hundreds of years. It's time straight white men develop responsibility to help end that oppression. I wish you all the best in these critically important endeavors. Thank you. We do have time for questions, so if anybody would like to pose a question, I will bring you the microphone. Not everybody at once. Absolutely. Well, it's the idea of aggrieved entitlement. I'm telling you that because I'm afraid that you're actually going to take something away from me. And it's this zero-sum game that if you gain something, I might lose something. And I'm not willing to do that. I don't know you, but I'm not willing to give you the power over me that you win and I lose. And what, what we don't understand, especially as men in the sense that a socially just 
world means that everybody benefits, not just certain people and not just folks that are minoritized. Everyone benefits, right? Economically, socially, politically, institutionally, educationally, everyone benefits. But the propaganda has worked very strongly against that. And so when we hear Honduran immigrants to the border, oh my gosh, what are they bringing in? We better, right? Or uh, um, Eastern European refugees or Syrian refugees, oh my gosh, no way, because they're going to be on welfare here pretty soon, right? The, the, this is propaganda that has been going on for far too long. And people like me have listened to that and said, must be right if they're saying that, right? So, yes, thank you for, thank you for saying that. Again, not not so. There we go. Again, maybe not so much a question, but a comment um, or a few comments. Uh, first, thank you so much for the study, for the labor of love of your book, and going through that, um, and for being here to share the message. Um, I mean, this is so helpful, and uh, I have a lot more to ponder yet. I mean, there's a lot there to think about. It's going to take me a while to process through a lot of that, and I look forward to thinking about it more. But I think the main thing I want to say, if I can articulate it correctly, I don't know if I can, is um, I want to thank you for providing a framework that can help allow straight white men a more positive way to engage with the issue. Because I think some of the resistance, and I can't speak for all, you know, I'm just myself, but I think sometimes the personal resistance is there's a desire inside to be helpful, but you're not sure what the proper approach would be that would be perceived as helpful. Uh, you know, because again, you don't want to come across as here's that white guy who dominates all the conversations and thinks he knows how to fix things that aren't maybe part of his life or things like, thoughts like that. Um, but when I'm listening to what you're saying here and communicating, which it, and it's very valuable, is maybe uh, it, it's helping me think about a more positive framework to engage and be part of the solution and to, and, to, and to get over some of those self-perceived re resistances to wanting to engage overtly mm -hmm. and how to, how to help the more internal uh, become more overtly helpful to people. Mm -hmm. So now I'm starting to ramble and I'm probably not making any sense, but I'm no. just trying to say that, yeah. that th you're providing a framework here I need to think a lot more about, but I think it's a very positive framework. Thank you. I think, I think what's important um, thank you for the comment. I think it's important to consider that this framework may be considered by others as coddling and providing too much grace to white men. And so that means that we, that we, that we cannot forget about the oppression um, and the, the putting down that white men continue to do on a college campus. And, and it means that we center the voices and the experiences of people who we have minoritized. So uh, on the one hand, I'm glad that, that white men, seemingly, right, identified white men, can provide that challenge and support. On the other hand, I wouldn't ask other people that are minoritized to do the same, right? I think, as I said earlier in the audience, this is, this is even though there are people of color in this room, even though there's likely folks with different uh, other sexual or gender identities in this room, the main audience are folks like us, right? And, and hopefully the others will also be involved, but I'm not, I, I'm not gonna ask them to be involved because this is our work that we need to do. This is the kind of self work. And so if, if that means that we get to provide challenge and support or even grace, then that's okay. But I'm not gonna ask Dr. Yarbrough to provide the same grace, right? Because that, that, that would negate the kind of system that we 
have been living in and that he and his family likely have been living in for the entirety of their lives, right? So, so that, that's, that's the balance that we have to keep. But I'm okay, I'm okay with, with that and I'm okay with providing that grace. Um, but we also have to look at what it means if we do that. So there's a... I'm curious in the schematic that you had with the uh, intellectual tornado, <laughs> yeah. intellectual vertigo. Yeah. What happens after that? So you get the you get the fist to the jaw, and there has to be a place then for these straight white college men to go, where they're not going to get insulted by uh, the bros and have some kind of community and some kind of friend group that they can be part of. So I, I see here, but th then it, but th there, the schematic doesn't tell me where you then go. The very quick answer would be, and the, I, I'm, I'm just kidding, as a college educator, they're leaving and I'm okay with them being more educated. No, um, I, don't, I don't know where they go, uh, but, but, but what, but what the research says, and hopefully what, what this work may do, is to send them on a way where they are more critically conscious, more empathetic, um, more solidary with folks. And hopefully that brings them on a path of community with others, even, even if those are other straight white guys. But I, I'm not sure that in terms of the model, which is obviously incomplete and imperfect as all these models are, um, that, that there's a space sort of that we have claimed that says, this is where all the straight white guys go who have thought about this and who work on this, right? Um, I, I do think that those spaces exist and folks that are here um, and, and folks on this campus uh, and at UWL and all other campuses, there are white men that do this kind of work and that have begun to think about this and that are in community, but now I'm rambling. I'm not sure that there is an answer for, for your question that I have within the auspices of this, of this study and this book. Yeah, and hopefully, that's a really great question. Hopefully, we're not dislodging them from their friend group. Hopefully, we are integrating them into that friend group with a different kind of mindset that hopefully then the friend group takes on. Because I have, I, have, I have friends that I've had for 45 years, and we can, not we, but they continue to make comments, and I'm like, all right, okay, well, we know what you do. It's not about what I do, it's about figuring out how to not do this anymore, because we're 48, right? So let's move on from this, and hopefully by that, and by sort of connecting in the personal sphere with your families, which is so difficult for them, we begin to integrate and we begin to see some of those comments that Derek had from his brothers sort of dissipate over time. It, I also have to be sure that we know that we're not gonna be part of all those conversations once they leave. And so part of this is, and hope is a, a widely stretched term, but I also hope that the, the education that we have provided in this sense allows them to have these conversations much later on so that they actually leave here and, and are developing in some way that they may not have thought about before. But that could be the next project where we connect back with them to figure out where they've been. I know we're over time and I want to be cognizant of you all have other schedules, so. Can we give Jorg a hand? <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh. Jorg, we appreciate you coming from La Crosse, and so we would like to present, on behalf of the Chancellor's Committee on Inclusive Excellence, you with our keynote award for our Spring Diversity Forum. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay. So, 
we appreciate everyone and your your attendance today. I hope that something has been shared with you that has been beneficial and impactful to you. We will convene again at four o'clock for our diversity awards. We will be uh, giving out the Fanny Hicklin Award, the John Truesdale Award, and the Roger Pulliam Award. And so we want to have, and a student award, thank you. So we want to have uh, folks around just to witness our campus community voted on these persons who will be receiving these honors. And so please come back at 4 o'clock. We have a, a light refreshments and light reception for you. But thank you so much. Thank you.